Hi guys, um, welcome to the Cambridge Creatives Q&A with Avery Siegel. I'm Hannah. And I'm Fabs. We are the co-presidents of Cambridge Creatives. We are a student-run creative collective. We are curating a series of talks with world-renowned professionals in film, TV and theatre. So please follow our Facebook page to find out more about future events. Just a few housekeeping rules before we begin. If you have any questions for our guest speaker, please type them in the Q&A box below, not the chat, and we will read them out for you. Um, also bear with us if there are any technical difficulties and let us know in the chat if there are any problems with hearing or seeing us. And most of all, enjoy the Q&A. So just a little introduction about our guest today. Avery won the award for best documentary short at the 2019 Academy Awards. Um, she's a second year student at the School of Liberal Arts and co-produced the documentary Period End of Sentence. Um, her and her fellow co-producers began their project in high school when their teacher took them to the United Nations Commission on the Status of Women and Girls. We're really honoured to have this filmmaker, fellow student and activist speak. So my first question for you, Avery, is when did you know that you wanted to work in film or did you have another plan when you were younger? So growing up in Los Angeles, I think I always had an idea that film was something that I was interested in, but I really had no idea what I wanted to do. Um, and I actually got involved in this project through the activism part. Mm -hmm. um, I was in my ninth grade English class. I don't know if you guys call it something different, but I was 13. And I was reading the Odyssey with my English class and my teacher, Melissa Burton, pulled me aside after class and was like, um, you have all these amazing points about feminism and I think you should, you'd really enjoy my club. So I started going to her club and that's kind of what turned into the PAD project through going to the UN. And we had no idea we wanted to make a film. We knew that we learned about this issue and we thought it would be really important to educate people on it. We just didn't know how to do it. And we went through a lot of different ideas and finally came to the conclusion that making a film would be the best way to get our point across and to educate a broader audience. Mm, amazing. Um, so were you inv involved with any kind of like film or theatre at university or high school or was it just like straight into this documentary as a form of activism? Um, I did theatre when I was very little but it wasn't until um, this activism that we decided that we should hire people but also learn how to make a film um, as a group of students and our teacher who really didn't know anything about film. Yeah. So how, how did you go about that? Who did you know, like, who to contact in order to get a sort of a team on hand? So growing up in Los Angeles and going to a school in the center of Los Angeles, we did have a lot of connections. Um, we really wanted it to be a student-based film. So we hired Rika Zapachi, our director, um, because she had just graduated USC Film School and uh, she was about the same age as us and so we really wanted to keep it within that age range um, and from there it was really like Rika guiding us. Um, we had we didn't really know what we were doing at the beginning um, it was a lot of trial and error but <laughs> we figured it out. Um, I'm working with her as a director were there any things that you established from the get-go in terms of how you wanted to work with each other? Um, did you give her sort of like the goals of what you wanted to achieve and she worked out the story? Yeah, so from the beginning, it was always a team effort. We didn't, when we came up with the idea, we had a bunch of different communities that we were working with and raising money to get machines for, but we didn't know which community we wanted to focus on for the film. And so, because we didn't really know what we were doing, we had a lot of conversations about what we wanted the film to come to have and what we wanted it to be able to portray. And she was able then to take our notes and kind of help us find our direction. Um, and it was a few times of going back and forth to India and finding our story, finding our main characters, but it was a joint effort. Mm -hmm. And how did you find your main characters? Um, did you get told of a village or did you go and seek people out? So we worked with a <coughs> nonprofit in India called Action India and they brought us to the community that we ended up working with, Katikara, and um, through them 
we started interviewing and um, the women that you see in the film are the women who stories kind of sh shine through the best and were the ones who were interested in being in the film. Um, yeah. Did you, did you find then quite a lot of women didn't want to be involved in the film? Did you have a problem with filming ever or like at all? It was never a problem with the woman. It was more a problem with the men in the community who were afraid of what giving the woman of the community power would do. Um, it, the machine is in um, a family home and the men of the home actually don't even know what the machine is for still. They think it's a diaper making machine. Um, so that's really interesting. Uh, a few different times, a few men of the community who were intoxicated would come up and make a scene and shut us down for filming mm -hmm. that day. Um, and I think, you know, it's, it's a very, very small village that's far off the grid. And having a lot of people, even though we try to keep our film crew very small, was just a disturbance to the normal day of day in the life of the um, Katikara village. And I think that that was kind of the biggest concern for the men. Um, but that was the biggest problem we faced while filming. Mm. Was that something that you anticipated in advance, sort of like coming across social taboos and having to work within that? Or was it quite a shock to get there and realize that people had those attitudes? Um, we were aware that the social taboos were gonna be a huge challenge. There was a lot of cultural barriers. Um, talking about menstruation in India is a huge social taboo. And so that alone was an issue that we knew that we were going to have to face. We just, you know, situations change and different um, issues come up at different times. We just, we didn't know exactly what was going to happen, but we were expecting that there would be some issues related to cultural and social taboos. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense. Also, did you get, did you go to India for the first time for the documentary or had you been there before? I actually have never been to India. Um, our team is small, but it's, uh, we're, we range from ages 14 to 50. Um, and so I was actually in school when Rika and Sam, our videographer, went twice. And then our team went another time. They were all six months apart. Um, I just unfortunately could not attend that trip, but I hope to go in the future. Mm. Um, and when you were deciding with Reka, what to focus on, the direct Reka. Um, what did you want at the core of the story? What was the most important message for you to get across? The most important message for us was what women can accomplish if they aren't held back by their periods. Um, what people can accomplish if, you know, someone who's bleeding can still do all of the things they would normally do and not have to just sit home and cook or clean or do very like sedentary things and we really were focused on the idea that educating people about menstruation would break that social taboo and normalize the conversation and make it a more public conversation rather than a private hush hush like only a family's close friends sort of conversation. Amazing was that part of your sort of decision making in sort of um collaborating with Netflix or, or selling the, the film to Netflix just so that as many people as possible could see it and be educated by it. Yeah, exactly. So we um, actually made our film and got nominated. And then we were like, okay, how can we get the most amount of people to see this? And that's when we got our, our offer from Netflix and we sold it to Netflix then because we thought it'd be a perfect platform so that everyone across the whole world could see it. And actually Netflix, in the, since quarantine started, actually released it on their YouTube platform, which is, an, we're so grateful. Um, so this way you don't need, even need to have a Netflix subscription to watch the film. You can also watch it on YouTube. So it's given so many people access to watch it. Um, and that was always our goal. Yeah, that's incredible. So you, you talk about this goal to like educate as many people as possible. Would you do another documentary in like a different country focusing on a different culture or like even like the taboo in, in America or something like that? Because they 
they change in, in, in different cultures? Right, so we actually, the same time that the Oscars were happening, we launched our nonprofit. So our pro nonprofit is called The Pad Project, and The Pad Project is working on all those taboos in America and all across the world. Um, we have eight or nine different partnerships now, and, you know, making another documentary isn't out of the picture, but we're working, we have, we're doing so many different projects right now, and I think the documentary led thousands and thousands of people to come to us and tell us about what their community needs, things that they were coming up in their communities, things like issues that they've seen. And so we've been able to work with so many different groups of people through that. And so at this exact moment, I don't think we necessarily need a doc another documentary. Um, we've had so many amazing opportunities since and it, they're continuing every day. Our nonprofit is really growing and it's amazing to watch. Yeah, it really is. Um, you said you, you found out about some of these issues from your visit to the UN. Would you ever, or have you been working with the UN and other sort of um, international organizations to spread this goal of education and stopping the taboo further? So we attended the United Nations Commission on the Status of Women through the Feminist Majority Foundation, which is based in um, Los Angeles, but is an international foundation. And they uh, were like our parent organization until we became our own um, registered 501c3. So that might be different for you guys. A registered nonprofit, like government organized. Um, and so we've, we work very closely with them. Um, we share some office space with them like they're very close partnerships with us and we they sent us to the UN and we actually premiered the film for the first time at um, the UN's Commission on the Status of Women a few years later so currently we're not working directly with the United Nations however we would love to work with more international partnerships um, right now we're working primarily in Africa and India um, when looking at the global scale but we would love to expand that. Amazing. Um, and you obviously worked with industry professionals whilst being a student, which is super exciting, but how did you balance that um, while still being at uni? So I'm actually going into my last year mm -hmm. um, in America, it's four years. So I, when the film was in like its final rounds of production and we were going to different film festivals, it was my first year. And I actually took a gap semester. So I was able to devote a lot of time to that. Um, but because our team is so big, it's not that big. It's, <laughs> it's a very relatively small team and we all volunteer our time. It's um, a group of my best friends from high school about five of us and our parents who are also really dedicated to it and then a few younger kids who have joined that's our core team um, and then two hired employees we're working on hiring our third and actually today we just launched our ambassador program which is a volunteer opportunity open to anyone all over the world who wants to get involved um, you can learn more about it on our website but so our team's very big to some extent and we're kind of based all over the US so we were able to delegate the different work um, and people would go to different film vessels that were close to where they were um, you know we have a bunch of different subcommittees so everyone's working on the topics that they're super interested in um, and I think we're all able to manage it because it is something that we're just so passionate about and so you know, you find time for things that you really care about. Yeah, well put. The ambassador scheme sounds really cool as well. Um, going into that a bit further, you were executive producer for the film or the documentary. How did you learn to be a producer? What was that like, that whole process like? Um, I don't know if I necessarily like learned how to do it. We just kind of did it. And um, yeah, we did have a lot of mentors helping us and 
the way we got our title of executive producer was we were able to raise the money for the film through launching a Kickstarter. We launched two different Kickstarter campaigns. Um, and, you know, it was a lot of trial and error of writing different things and Kickstarter just not approving it and fixing it and rewriting it. And um, it was a difficult process, but um, ultimately we were able to obtain the funds that we needed to start making the film and then finish the film. And yeah. <laughs> Sounds like a, a crazy process. Yeah. Um, do you have any tips for like fellow students, whether they're activists or filmmakers, on how to one maybe like set up a, a project like the um, the PAP project or how to kickstart um, a documentary? I would say to have an idea of what you want to do, like a very solid idea, and look at the project as a whole and see if there's other people in the field who are doing something similar. And if, if they are, if it's something that you can partner up and do together, um, you know, the world of documentary specifically is very community based and very helpful, very hands on. Um, but I think Kickstarter, I think it's kick, just kickstarter.com is a great um, way to start funding. Um, because you can really show a broad audience what you want to do and it makes fundraising super easy so mm -hmm. i would recommend doing that but really just like not giving up you know it was crazy when we were like at that time we were a group of 15 year olds and five of us and our english teacher and we're like we're gonna make a movie and everyone's like okay <laughs> and mm -hmm. you know we just kept trying and we kept winning and we were like what is happening but it worked <laughs> and so i think if you just put your mind to it and keep trying, which I know sounds a little cheesy, but it really does work. Hmm. Are there any other sort of goals that you would like to achieve, whether that's with the PAD project or like a whole other sort of social activism project? Um, with the PAD project, our main goal and what I've kind of been focusing on is expanding our work in the US. Um, we worked very internationally in the beginning and you know there's so many problems that the US has um, especially um, in relation to access to menstrual products and we want to start working with our community specifically in Los Angeles but also all over the US um, and so that's our main goal right now. Uh, yeah. Mm. Would you, or I don't, I don't know if you do already, work with sort of um, like corporations who um, make pads and stuff like that? Because I know that like we, we've had a discussion um, in the UK and had, there was a campaign called Free Periods and mm -hmm. it was discussing how like around the taboo, there's this problem with adverts about pads and you never actually see blood. Um, so would you work with like, always or Tampax or other um, American organizations to change how it's um, portrayed in the media as well? That's a really interesting idea. We actually, that hasn't been as prominent in the US. Um, and it's something I haven't noticed. I actually, I don't watch much TV because I do watch a lot of Netflix and stuff like that. But I have noticed in general, I studied abroad in London last year, and my friends and I would always talk about how the adverts in the UK were much more proper and like very civilized and very like nice, whereas in the US they're kind of more demanding. Mm -hmm. um, I, I remember there's like a lot of like, you might want to try or you should it was like all suggesting whereas the US it's like try this um, so I haven't noticed that uh, maybe there is more blood in the US um, but we actually just uh, about um, two months ago we finally launched our first corporate campaign a corporate partnership with P&G Procter and Gamble um, and they have a company within Procter & Gamble called This Is L, which they produce all organic tampons and pads. And it's a one-for-one -one model. So we've been working with them very closely. Um, 
yeah so that's our first corporate partnership which we're super excited about yeah really cool yeah going from the big corporations to like the individual responses what were the responses like to your um documentary and did you get any particularly interesting responses that you hadn't really anticipated i mean we thought that maybe a couple hundred people would see this and we had no idea how big the reach was going to be so we were so so ecstatic with the numbers of people who watched it and then of course you know going all the way through the oscars um so that was like we had an overwhelming amount of responses and we still do today um our following is growing every day it's crazy like we kept being like when is this is this gonna stop one day like but we're you know we're getting more followers on our social media platforms every day um there's a lot of people who will comment on our posts or dm us about how like what we're doing is horrible and how it's so like we should not be talking about periods and blood and menstruation which i think is always shocking for us because in our bubble it's something we talk about so openly and so constantly and it's crazy every time someone comments like accusing us of being these horrible monsters um but it's also a learning experience because we can understand that you know there's still work to be done and so every time we get a comment like that it's always a reminder like we're so far from ending this taboo and we still need to work yeah i completely get that um and then moving on to a different kind of reaction um the oscars when did you find out that your documentary was nominated for an oscar we found out um i'm trying to remember the specific dates but the way it worked is you have to win specific film festivals to qualify to be nominated. Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah, which I had no idea how that worked. Um, you know, we weren't even really expecting to do this. We were expecting to finish our film and somehow give it to students and educators. And our Rika was like, why don't we just start submitting into film festivals while we're just waiting? And so we started winning these film festivals and we we're like, whoa, what's happening? I guess we should continue to do this. So that's how we got there. And so we found out that what happens is you get, you qualify and then you get shortlisted. And then from the shortlist, half get nominated. Oh, cool. um, so it was a very long process um, that, you know, no one thought we were going to get this far, but we did and it was wonderful. <laughs> when did you realize that your film was going to go to more people than students and educators? Was it when you won a f the first film festival or when, when was it? I think it was probably when we started winning film festivals and people were coming up to us and like how can we donate, how can we get involved and I think that's when we realized that we were starting more of a movement um, and it kind of just continued to grow as time went on and we continued to reach more people, go to more film festivals, have more followings, have more emails and contacts. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Um, what was the run-up to the Oscars like? This is just such a gratuitous question, but I'm curious. How, was, how were the Oscars? Like, how, like what was the run-up to the Oscars like? Oh. Did you have to do loads of promotion or was it like getting ready for the Oscars? Like what, what was going through so your head at the time? We, like the actual journey was a little different because Netflix had bought our film by then so they were in charge of all the PR and all of the like promotional stuff that we were working on um, and in charge of like the logistics of getting to the Oscars. Um, they flew in our team from India which was amazing so the girls who were featuring the film, the women, um, were all in LA with us um, and they organized all of that so you know, it was a lot of <laughs> logistical stuff, but we were lucky that Netflix was handling the majority of that. Mm -hmm. And for you personally, how was it, what was it like um, just in your day-to-day -day life knowing that you've been nominated for an Oscar? Um, it was really, really strange, you know, in the US sororities and fraternities are such a big thing, especially I go to Tulane University, which is a very Greek heavy school and I'm not in a sorority because for a lot of reasons but 
when you first meet someone, they're always like, oh, what story are you in? And I'm always like, oh, I'm, I'm not in one. But now, and even then, they were like, oh, they'd be like, oh, wait, are you Oscar girl? <laughs> and so it's super <laughs> weird for me because this is something that I've been working on quietly since I was 13. And then it wasn't until I was 19 that someone was like, people started being like, oh, you're Oscar girl. Um, <laughs> You know, a lot of times it was frustrating because people would be like, oh, you're Oscar girl, but wouldn't talk about any of the issues that our, my film was raising. And it was like, yeah, but uh, yeah, we did win an Oscar, but let's talk about all the other things of all the reasons why it got this far. And so, yeah, it was frustrating, but also really gratifying at the same time. Mm -hmm. And how was the ceremony itself? Was that, was it fun? Was it hectic? Um, yeah. It was so hectic and scary. I think it did not feel real until we were sitting in our seats and, you know, they have order on like the program of what's coming next. And we were all sitting there and we, I, I have video of, um, I was sitting, we all, our seats were all kind of separated, but I was sitting with one of my best friends and my mom, who is a um, producer as well and her dad and my mom was filming us and we were just kind of like no no there's no way there's no way and then all of a sudden they called us and we were both like it was a shock um mm -hmm. it was a lot of sh shock and then having to fly back to school the next day was just yeah. so weird um yeah. yeah. How do people react at home? Were they like, oh my god, you just won an Oscar? Or was it weird to just come back into normal life with no one really realising? At school, no. I mean, I'm a film major now. I want to go into film. So my classes are film and my teachers were freaking out. I taught a lot <laughs> of classes that week. But it was just interesting because it was the same thing that I've been doing for six years. And all of a sudden, because I won an Oscar, my teacher's like, oh, would you, would you want to teach this class? And I was like, I don't know anything I more today than I knew last week. Mm -hmm. So that was a really weird thing to think about. Yeah. How did the girls that flew over from India enjoy the ceremony? Did they find it exciting or was it a bit different for them? So they were here for actually about a month. Um, oh. And I think it was super exciting, but also the it was, you know, a lot of culture shock. Um, most of them had never been out of their village. So it was very crazy and um, amazing, but also scary. <laughs> um, but it was great to have our whole team together, especially because at the time, only half of our team had met everyone. Um, so it was just the night before, we all sat and had dinner together. And it was, we were all crying. And a lot of the women from India don't speak one lick of English and we only had one translator. So it was a lot of like, it was very hard to communicate, but we all understood what was happening. Yeah, it sounds really powerful. Yeah. Um, you spoke about how like you're now doing a film major and you want to go into film. Would you in the future always like to sort of merge your activism and your film and um, work in documentaries or would you be up for any other kind of filmmaking? That's what I think I want to go into right now, um, documentary filmmaking, but I don't know for sure. I'm mm. keeping all of my options. Open. Good idea. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, would you like to continue producing or would you direct or cinematography or what kind of? Um, to be honest, I'm not sure. My major is communications. So I have a lot of options of what I would like to ultimately do. Amazing. Um, and do you have any kind of like film projects in the pipeline, whether that's through your degree or like anything that you would dream to make a project of? I have a lot of ideas in the back of my head, but nothing that I'm working on currently. You know, I'm trying to finish my last year of school and um, I have an internship at the PAD project, so I'm focused a lot of my time on that. Cool. That makes a lot of sense. <laughs> doing your final year and doing a documentary would be yeah. <laughs> a lot. Um, do you want to 
if in the future you got who basically who would you want to work with the most um out of any documentary maker that i know that's a very hard question to ask but if there was one documentary maker that you could work with who would you work with oh that's such a hard question i'm gonna talk more of a genre i'll say yeah, yeah. i really am interested in nature documentaries um that's and cool. so I mean, there's so many amazing documentarians. And so, you know, any of the big <laughs> ones, but I really think the field of nature documentaries and conservation is super interesting. Hmm. Yeah, I watched um, Our Planet yesterday, loved it. I know that's very basic. Yeah. Um, yeah, so now we're gonna take some questions from the audience in a bit. Um, so to the audience, please type your questions into the Q&A box and we will read them out. And while we're waiting, we'll ask our final question. Um, do you have any film or TV recommendations to fill our lockdown summer? <laughs> do you guys have Hulu? Yeah. Um, I have been watching Rami right now. I really like it. Um, also on Netflix, kind of a doc series, but Lennox Hill is super interesting, um, especially the coronavirus one, which is the last episode. So my top two recommendations right now <laughs> amazing thank you um from an anonymous attendee they have asked have you considered merging your non-profit and sharing costs both direct and indirect sharing the cost of our yeah I'm not. Non-profit. yeah i think that's cool. um right now it's not public um just because we're still growing our non-profit and we do not have lots of funds, um, but almost everyone works as a volunteer except for uh, two employees. So almost all of our funds are going directly to the projects and communities that we're working on. Cool, thank you. Um, next question also asked by an anonymous attendee. How do you challenge taboo whilst also working in a culturally sensitive and competent fashion? Every time that we enter a community or we start working with a community, it's a partnership. It's never us versus them type of mentality. It's always a joint effort. And I think, <clears throat> excuse me, that's how we are able to kind of cross those barriers it's to work as a team and to make sure that it's not no one's helping anyone who doesn't want to be helped there's no savior aspect to it it's all just people who want to learn and want to break this taboo and it's a joint team that comes together to make sure that that gets done when you say that it's a team effort, how did you establish the team just physically? Did you establish the team through working with Action India or did you find people in the local community and realize that one person's voice was very strong and that you could work with them? So specifically for Katikara and um, period end of sentence, we were connected to Action India and Action India is a super powerful organization within India. Um, that head of Action India is this woman named Gowry, who's one of the biggest feminists in India. Um, she's amazing. She's in her 80s and wonderful. She stayed at my house um, for the Oscar, so I got to know her very well. And she was kind of the guiding force of the Indian half of the team. Um, and we also had a field producer um, named Mandy in India who was able to manage um, our Indian film crew. Um, so, you know, anyone who really showed a strong interest who was part of Action India automatically joined our team and we still work very closely with them today. Um, as for our American team, specifically our Los Angeles based team, we are, as of now, um, literally today when we launched our ambassador program, um, anyone who wants to can apply to be a part of our volunteer program. Um, in the past, it's unfortunately, we haven't had the resources to move it outside of the high school that we started it from. So it was kind of just open to the high schoolers at the school. But now anyone who wants to can be a part of our, it's no longer American team. It's our, just our team. 
Amazing. That's really cool. Could you tell us a bit more about that ambassadors program and how people can apply or get involved? And is there like yeah? A so it's on our. You go to our website and you go to the take action plate page. It's under the educate section, um, and you'll find all of the different rules and responsibilities there. But it's pretty much just a way for us to grow our team, um, and we want to be able to have people all over the world who are just pretty much active on actively engaging on ending the t social taboo of menstruation and um, these ambassadors their job will be to engage their community to host either virtual or in-person um, events and raise money for local shelters who need supplies um whole list of things pretty basic but um it's open to we have two different programs a student ambassador program and a general ambassador program um the general ambassador program is open to anyone out of college or uni and the student one is middle school age through 18 19. um and then we also have an option where a group of people could come together and create a circle of ambassadors and have a sort of like club type of thing um, where they could work together to combat social taboos in their community. That sounds amazing. Very cool. Um, another question from an anonymous um, attendee. How did you find out which film festivals to submit your film to? So our publicist um, and producer, Lisa Tazak, um, this is her job, she actually, not how we got bought by Netflix, but she works for Netflix. And um, she is an award strategist. And so she knew exactly what to apply for. Um, also, if you search up, if you search on um, the internet, Oscar qualifying film festivals, you'll find the list of them. Um, they're competitive to get into. Sometimes there are fees. Um, but if it's a nonprofit, you can normally get the fee waived, which we did majority of the time yeah that sounds so cool yeah what was the sort of the, the technicalities of of having your film be bought by netflix like how how did that happen did you have to approach them or were you approached by them so it's kind of a, a funny story not funny uh, blurred lines but so lisa tabak was started her job at netflix kind of around that time and we had been nominated and we were against two other Netflix films. <laughs> and I think, you know, Ted Saranta saw our film and was like, this is really good. He didn't, the reason why we hadn't had an off film before is because they had filled their 2020, 2019 through like 2023 doc spots and they didn't have any room and then he saw our film and I think he realized that he was missing an opportunity. So we're so fortunate that he bought it. Um, you know, short films are not, short documentaries are not worth a ton of money. Um, but so it wasn't about the money for us. We weren't trying to, you know, get a huge deal. We were just trying to find a platform that would best suit us. So, it didn't really matter how how much anyone would offer us. It would, we were just trying to figure out how we could use the film to educate, and if there were any clauses that would make it harder for us to get the film out to different educators, possibly for free. Um, so that's what we were looking for in a possible buyer. Cool. Um, can you guys hear me? By the way, my it says my internet connection is unstable. No, we can hear you. Okay, cool, perfect. Um, what would you say are the key elements that are essential to the success in the following areas? First one, your activism. And the key is success. I think it's kind of what I was talking about earlier, your passion. Mm -hmm. um, because if you're super passionate about something, you won't stop being an activist about it. You'll talk about it all the time. You know, you'll talk about it to people, even if they don't want to listen. And I think that's how you get your point across. Mm -hmm. um, and then the second one, your film production, what was the key element to that? I kind of hmm, I think it was passion again, just because 
we really wanted people to know about this. Mm -hmm. I think because we were so passionate about the activist part of the film, we knew that the film and making a film and making it so that people could see it all over the world would be a tool to further that activism start a conversation. And so we were, you know, there was no deadline or anything, but we were super, super insistent that the film would come out and would be super prominent and that people could find it and talk about it and listen and learn and relearn. And so I think without our passion, it wouldn't have come out in such a timely manner. And yeah, it wouldn't have been as big of a deal. Um, just like a, a question to summarize the whole project, what was the best moment or the most exciting moment that kind of sticks out as like a really important moment for the entire sort of like documentary making process? I think there's a few, uh, there's so many moments, but I think one of the, the most, the craziest moments for me, just because I didn't get a chance to go to India was um, one of my best friends and I, who's part of the founding board as well, we were uh, walking into the house that we were having dinner at the night before the Oscars and we could see in like the front window everyone sitting at or around a table talking and um, Sneha who is the main character of the film the one who's studying to be in the police force was sitting like right in the window and I was walking in with my friend and Claire and we looked at each other and we both started crying we we're like oh my god that's her that's her that's her and we were like so starstruck um, and then you know she saw us and she started crying we we're like why are you crying <laughs> um, <laughs> So that was a crazy moment. And then a little bit later when we, the next day when we were at the Oscars, we were, I was standing with Lisa Tabak and a few of us and Amy Adams came over and was talking to us. And she said, she was like, oh, what are you here for? And Lisa was like, oh, period in a sentence. And she said, I voted for that film. That was the most amazing film I've ever seen. If you don't win, I don't know what will happen. Like, I, I don't understand. And I think that was the moment we were like, what? <laughs> like, <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> um, Cause you know, it just been such a small team that we had been like doing all these watches and editing and rewatching in my English teacher's classroom sitting on the floor. And all of a sudden she was like, this is an amazing film. Yeah. I think that was like when we were like, oh, wait, maybe we have a chance right now. Maybe we're not just like attending the Oscars. <laughs> That's crazy. You've got, you've got celebrity fans. <laughs> um, just as kind of like an overall question, why do you think film is such a powerful tool and medium to educate people? Um, Sorry, completely put you on the spot. <laughs> I think film... I think with film, it's a great way for people to educate themselves and relearn specific things because it can kind of be an individualized tool. Mm. Um, I think when someone, when there's a film on Netflix or a film on another streaming platform or YouTube, you actively choose to watch it and learn. Um, whereas in some other cases, people are forcing you and telling you that you have to do something. Whereas when you click on a Netflix film to watch something, you're clicking on it to learn. Um, and also I think film gives you a light, gives you kind of like a, a spotlight into, into someone's world. And instead of just imagining something, you can really imagine yourself in their shoes. And I think that will that gives someone the opportunity to really learn about something new um, and care deeply about it, not just see it and move on. Definitely, yeah. Perfect. Amazing. Words. Um, I think that's all we have time for, actually. So thank you so much, Avery, for your wonderful answers and for giving us your time. And thank you to everyone who joined the call and asked such amazing questions. Thank um, you.
And to everyone else, please like our Facebook page for more updates and register for our interview with musician and composer Erin Baron Cohen on Wednesday, July 22nd at 6.30 p.m. And thank you so much, Avery. We really, really appreciate you giving us your time and we look forward to see what you do next in the future.